A lot of CND's activities that were well known were the big national demonstrations, huge rallies in uh, Hyde Park, for example, but there were loads and loads of local demonstrations and rallies across the country throughout this period. I mean, it was almost like people were on permanent mobilisation alert, so to speak. So there was all that going on. And then at the same time, there was a huge wave towards uh, direct action, and the direct action was focused on the military bases. Um, the most famous one, of course, is Greenham Common uh, Women's Peace Camp, because it was a women's peace camp and it caught the headlines and they had very innovative and bold campaigning methods, let's say, you know, dancing on the silos and breaking in through the fences and embracing the base. Um, but there were lots of other peace camps, mixed peace camps, other places. So Molesworth, for example, which was one of the Greenham and Molesworth were the places where the cruise missiles were coming to. There was a peace camp there, and and many other bases as well. Well, C and D's action has never varied very much. Partly it's publicity, it's education, pamphlets, literatures, it's uh, films or video videos. In fact, Peter Watkins, his film for the BBC called The War Game, was an absolute standard in groups around the country. At this distance, the heat wave is sufficient to cause melting of the upturned eyeball. If nobody's seen it, they ought to go and have a look at it. Um, uh, that was the sort of thing, public education. And then every once in a while, we would have some demonstration of some sort, uh, very often in London, sometimes in Trafalgar Square, but um, outward expression of what we were doing was quite important to our position and things. The CND was consistent in opposing both the acquisition of Trident um, and the deployment of cruise missiles throughout this period. But clearly those messages resonated to differing extents in different parts of the UK. Uh, so the cruise missiles were to be stationed at two military bases, uh, one in Berkshire, one in uh, Cambridgeshire. Um, and so consequently, cruise or opposition to cruise uh, resonated much more strongly, uh, say, in the south of England, uh, whereas opposition to Trident um, was much more important in Scotland. So the, um, the Clyde naval base is where initially the, the Polaris, the precursor to, to Trident, uh, was based, and then, of course, uh, Trident would, would be based there subsequently. So, as a result, CND activities in Scotland tended to be much more focused on opposition to Trident, uh, whereas the anti-cruise message uh, featured much more prominently in, in England as well as Wales. Well, I think END was in a way the kind of intellectual wing. Um, in a way, the movement, it, certainly in this country and perhaps all over Europe, was uh, inspired by E.P. Thompson's pamphlet, Protest and Survive. But I think E.P. Thompson and idea in Ken Coates, and I was part of it, was that in the past, anti-nuclear campaigns were very easily dealt with by the establishment because you could accuse them of being pro-Soviet. And also that unilateralism was only about Britain. So we wanted to make it clear that we were both unilateralist and multilateralist. We didn't care how you got rid of nuclear weapons and we wanted it from the whole of Europe. And we wanted to make it clear that we were not just an anti-nuclear movement, we were an anti-Cold War movement. And so from the beginning we tried to make links with dissidents in Eastern Europe. So in 1980, April 1980, the END appeal was launched and it just collected thousands of signatures from all over Europe, including Olaf Palma, Václav Havel, uh, the Czech Jazz. Actually, Václav Havel signed later, but the Czech Jazz section <laughs> signed straight away. And um, so, you know, it became the sort of in a way, the literature of the movement. What is interesting about this transnational movement of peace uh, mobilization that we're talking about and we're discussing it as a pan-European phenomena is because the style of activism was really global, even when the framing of the message was quite local or regional. So in, in the UK, for example, we know that the main message was unilateral nuclear disarmament. In the Nordic states, it was about nuclear-free zones. 
in places like Spain and Greece was about membership of NATO and removal of bases. But despite these differences in framing, what was interesting is that these activists were emulating each other in terms of how to communicate their message because it had to be low cost, but it had to be truly effective. So what happened is that they were looking at each other either by, let's take the example of Greek Common, the air base, the, woman, the women's camp, proved to be really an inspirational example for other peace camps in Comiso in Italy uh, or in Australia, uh, where they were creating this uh, feminized space for uh, self-action and kind of dissent against nuclear activity. But also at the same time, because um, it was so successful in, in countries like the United States, like nuclear freeze or in the, in the United Kingdom, um, with the CND campaign, the activists really learned how to get their message across. And the way to do that was through kind of the same kind of tactics, demonstrations, sit-ins, sit human chains across bases, peace camps, all of them with the hope and, uh, and uh, idea to really affect pu public opinion and make them motivated to get interested and put the topic on the political agenda. Well, I think when you see the, the, the world that the government were operating in, there was growing concern, which the peace movement picked up on, about the risks of nuclear war and indeed what nuclear war would look like if it occurred. So there were TV programs and so on. Uh, and the peace movement uh, piggybacked on this growing concern and amplified it and tried to develop it and to develop in two directions. One, to stop the deployment of crews in this country uh, and two, to try and stop the decision to modernise the UK's independent deterrent.